All right, hello everyone. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, I don't have slides to go along with this. I just want you to understand why I don't believe the resurrection of Jesus. So you might not agree with everything I have to say, but my purpose here is to sort of communicate to you so you understand where I'm coming from. Now to help you understand where I'm coming from, let me start with an analogy. If I tell you I own a car, I usually don't have to present very much evidence to prove it because you've already observed mountains of evidence that people like me own cars, so that's not an unusual claim. But if I say I own a nuclear missile, you have just as much evidence that people like me don't own nuclear missiles, so you would all agree I would need much more evidence to convince you that I owned one of those. Now suppose I told you I own an interstellar spacecraft. That would be an even more extraordinary claim because there is no general knowledge supporting it at all. Not only do you have lots of very good evidence that people like me don't own interstellar spacecraft, you also have no evidence this has ever been true for anyone, unlike nuclear missiles, which you know at least some people have. Therefore, the burden of evidence I would have to bear here is truly enormous. I mean, just think what it would take what, for me, for you to believe that I really did have an interstellar spacecraft, and you'll see what I mean. But there is no more evidence supporting the generalization that people like Jesus get resurrected from the dead than there is for people owning starships. Therefore, the claim that Jesus rose from the dead is an extraordinary claim. So just like a claim to own a starship, it requires extraordinary evidence. Not because it's impossible, but because it's incredible. We have no more evidence of miraculous resurrections on our planet than we have for starships on our planet. So for me, Mike's evidence wouldn't be enough, for example, to prove Jesus owned a starship, if that's, for example, what he were defending. So in this case, it isn't good enough to prove to me that Jesus really rose from the dead. Now, to begin with, even if we believe the story that the tomb of Jesus was found empty, bodies go missing all the time. And he didn't actually bring up the issue of the empty tomb. He actually admitted that there's a lot of disagreement among scholars regarding the reliability of the Gospels. I'm actually going to cover the issue of the Gospels quite a lot because I think a lot of people here find that evidence convincing. To begin with, though, even if we believe the story that the tomb of Jesus was found empty, bodies go missing all the time. But when bodies go missing, we don't assume they rose from the dead. To the contrary, we know when bodies go missing, it's usually because they were stolen or misplaced. You would have to disprove those theories before you could believe anything less likely, because those things are so much more probable. The same goes for appearances of the dead. The dead appear to people all over the world, people who see them even have conversations with them and swear it was real. But we don't conclude those dead people were resurrected. We have no confirmed scientific evidence that miraculous resurrections occur, but we do have abundant scientific evidence that hallucinations occur. Certainly most appearances of the dead and of gods and spirits and other strange things people see are hallucinations, not real visitations. And this even happens with groups. For example, the Shaker cults and the Cargo cults uh, all claim to have had mass hallucinations of different kinds. And the same goes for amazing stories. Now, in 520 AD, an anonymous monk recorded the life of Saint Genevieve, who had died only 10 years before. In his account of her life, he describes how when she ordered a cursed tree cut down, monsters sprang from it and breathed a fatal stench on many men for two hours. While she was sailing, 11 ships capsized, but at her prayers, they were righted again, spontaneously. She created water and oil from nothing before astonished crowds, healed the blind and lame, and several people who stole things from her actually went blind instead. No one wrote anything to contradict or challenge these claims, and they were written very near the time of the event supposedly happened. So there's no doubt that even the most fabulous beliefs, the most fabulous stories and claims, can arise within a single generation, within a matter of years, and eclipse any contrary historical fact. That's why historians like me have to be very skeptical. Another example. Less than 50 years after the Persian Wars ended in 479 BC, Herodotus asked, numerous eyewitnesses and their children about the things that happened. Just like Paul, he was actually writing a history. So he actually calls it that the same verb, but he actually is writing a history. Paul didn't do that. But he went and questioned people, questioned the witnesses, and got information from them. And from their witness, he relates without any doubt that the Temple of Delphi magically defended itself with animated armaments, lightning bolts, and collapsing cliffs. The sacred olive tree of Athens, though burned by the Persians, grew a new shoot an arm's length in a single day. And all the leading men of Athens witnessed it. A crowd of soldiers saw a horse give birth to a rabbit, and a whole camp witnessed a mass resurrection of cooked fish. An empty tomb looks quite trivial by comparison. And also the resurrection claim, similarly. If these kinds of things could be made up in only a generation, less than a generation, and remain unchallenged by anyone, so could the tale of a resurrection or any other similar miracle, especially if you're talking about a mass resurrection of cooked fish seen by a whole town.
This is especially the case when we have a good reason to be suspicious. Romulus, the mythical founder of Rome, just like Jesus, was the son of God incarnate, born of a virgin, and killed by the corrupt leaders of the city. And just like Jesus, darkness covered the earth at his death, supposedly, as we're told, and like Jesus, his body went missing also. And like Jesus, he was subsequently resurrected from the dead, appeared to the living on a road to the city to communicate his gospel, and then ascended to heaven to rule from on high. There were many other resurrected gods in ancient cults of the time, including Zalmoxis and Osiris, who each died and rose again, and who each offered salvation to believers. The resurrection cults of Romulus, Osiris, and Zalmoxis all predate Christianity by more than a century and would have been known in the Roman Middle East where Christianity began. Now, it can't be a coincidence that Jesus is also a son of God who also died and rose from the dead. The kind of story was clearly popular at the time. Everyone was making up versions of it. So I have to ask myself, why should I believe that Jesus' story is any different from those stories? The similarities are too suspicious for me. Now, there are only two sources of historical evidence for the Jesus story, the Gospels and the Epistles. Now, uh, Mike hasn't actually gone into discussing the Gospels very much, or the Gospel evidence, so I might actually skip some of this. I might come back to it more if I have uh, more to say on the point and more time. He sticks to the Epistles, so let's talk about that. Now, written long before the Gospels, many decades before the Gospels, were the Epistles. But to understand what's in them, we have to understand some facts from psychology and the anthropology of religion. Now, we've documented many people have what's called schizotypal personality. They hallucinate regularly, but are fully functional. And we've documented that these people tend to congregate around holy men and in religious cults. We actually have scientific studies of this. These people see all kinds of things, gods, spirits, signs in the sky. It's natural and normal. And there are a lot of these people, uh, not by proportion in the population, but in a large population, you'll find many of them. When we turn to Paul's epistles, we find that the earliest Christians were hallucinating on a regular basis, entering ecstatic trances and prophesying and having visions and relaying the communications of spirits and speaking in tongues. So much, in fact, that Paul had to set up rules of order to control the din, and he says outsiders would think they were lunatics if they behaved out of order. That tells me the first Christians were schizotypal which means we should be very suspicious of anything incredible they claim to have seen, especially when it confirms their religious desires and expectations. So when Paul says Jesus suddenly appeared to these people on isolated occasions, we have every reason to expect they were hallucinating, even as groups, and I might come to that again later. Paul only mentions for himself scripture and visions as his sources. Now, Mike says that he, he probably got stories also from the first disciples, but we don't know what stories he got from the disciples. And Paul, when he's actually arguing for the resurrection, he never actually cites this information. When he says, I handed on to you what was handed on to me, uh, he uses the exact same phrase in, the, in Galatians, in the letter of Galatians, uh, Galatians 1, where he actually says, uh, I received the gospel I received and handed on to you as the gospel I received from Jesus. And he actually says that he received it in a revelation not from a man. And this was three years before he talked to the disciples. So when he's talking about stuff later on, we're not sure exactly how much of what he's talking about is what he got from the disciples versus how much he got in direct conversations with Jesus. And Paul actually reports having conversations with Jesus on a regular basis. So Paul only mentions scripture and visions as his sources, and Paul cites no other sources that anyone else had. No one else had any other sources but scripture and visions as far as Paul knows, as far as we can tell from the letters. Paul says others saw Jesus just like he did. He doesn't make any distinctions, and he says he only saw Jesus in a revelation. And he says he only saw Jesus in a vision, and most visions like that, the whole world over, are religiously inspired hallucinations, not real appearances of gods, of the, gods or, or of the dead. So just based on what the prior probability is, based on what established facts are, what's actually normal and usual, I have no reason to believe any differently for the origins of Christianity than, for example, what, uh, than for any other cult that has similar claims of seeing gods or spirits of the dead. Paul doesn't tell us what exactly he and these first Christians saw. He doesn't actually go into detail. He doesn't say whether it was a bodily apparition, the same way tribal Hawaiians hallucinate meetings and conversations with recently dead relatives. He doesn't, or if it's a vision of Christ up in the clouds, like the Apostle Stephen is said to have seen. Uh, in the book of Acts, Stephen looks up in court and says, I see Jesus up in the clouds in heaven. Of course, everyone else who was around there, the Jewish Sanhedrin, didn't see what he saw. That's a hallucination. Uh, or if it was just a startling talking light in the sky, as Paul is said to have seen. The epistles don't say. They don't give us any details. We don't know what was said. We don't know what actually was seen. We don't know what the people actually said they saw. And as I explained, 
uh, and as I will explain if I have time, I don't trust what the Gospels say. Uh, I don't know if uh, Mike will say more about the Gospels. He actually skipped right past them, really. Uh, the Gospel of Mark, for example, doesn't say what kind of visions they are, and later visions that are reported in the Gospels are actually generally very suspicious stories that I don't trust at all. Now, I believe only an ordinary explanation can easily explain why Jesus only appeared to die-hard believers and then much later to only one of millions of outsiders across the planet, Paul. If God himself were really appearing to people and really was on a compassionate mission to reform and save the world, he could have visited Pilate, Herod, the Sanhedrin, the masses of Jerusalem, the Roman legions, even the emperor and senate of Rome. He could have flown to America, as actually the Mormons believe he did, and even China, preaching in all the temples and courts of Asia. In fact, being God, he could have appeared to everyone on earth. He could visit me right now, or you. He could appear right now and settle this debate. Done. If Jesus was a God and really wanted to save the world, he would have appeared and delivered his gospel personally to the whole world and would still be doing so. I would do so if I were in his position, and God can't be more compassionate than I am in that respect. It's much less probable he'd appear only to one small group of believers and only one lone outsider in one tiny place just one time 2,000 years ago and then give up. But if Christianity originated as a natural movement inspired by ordinary hallucinations, then we would expect it to arise in only one small group, in one small place and time, and especially where, as in antiquity, regular hallucinators were often respected as holy and their hallucinations believed to be divine communications. And that's exactly when and where it began. The fact that it looks much like other resurrected god cults of that very time and place, at that time and place, only confirms the point. It was just another religion like them, with made-up stories started by religious fanatics stirred by visions. The ordinary explanation thus predicts all we see, whereas the extraordinary explanation doesn't. And this applies even to Paul. You might think this outsider, this persecutor of the church is an unusual occurrence. Why would he see Jesus? Well, the, obviously, whatever the explanation is, it has to be a rare explanation because it, was only, it only happened once. There are hundreds of persecutors of the Christians, millions of outsiders, and Jesus only appears to one of them. So obviously, whatever the cause was, it has to be something very rare. Now, we actually know, we actually have established in psychology certain phenomena like this, uh, one of which is called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is when you start to have two beliefs that conflict with each other. And this, become, this actually creates an agitating, discomforting state. And you struggle to get out of this state by reconciling or picking one side of the contradiction or finding a way to harmonize them. If you're schizotypal, if you're prone to hallucinations, as Paul clearly was, he talks about having visions and revelations all the time, having conversations with Jesus, the way out, and we know this from scientific studies, the way out of that is to hallucinate something that resolves the contradiction. Because when we, what we, one thing they've studied in schizotypal personalities is that having the hallucinations actually reduces stress in their lives. They actually live better lives, more comforting lives because of it. So this is one of the strategies that would be readily apparent to someone like Paul. If he were persecuting the Christian church and started to feel guilty about it, if he saw their moral behavior and realized that they were actually in the right in terms of what the right behavior was, if he realized that he was doing wrong, if he felt that he had wronged God, if anything that came, if he started to be convinced by uh, their very fervent declarations that they had seen Jesus in the sky or, or whatever it was that they were claiming at the time, he would have cognitive dissonance. Here he is, he's hurt and injured these people and done wrong by God, while at the same time, he's feeling affinity and agreement with their morals and with their uh, convictions. The way out is to hallucinate an experience of Jesus. So that he could see Jesus himself, experience the gospel, and become a leader, and actually repent of his sins, in a sense, atone for his sins by actually doing good and spreading the word, and so on. So, now you might say that's the, it's improbable, but we know for a fact all of the elements of that could occur. Well, these are, and I've not advocated anything that's actually bizarre. And they would occur rarely, of course, uh, but then again, Paul is a rare case. He's like the only outsider that was actually converted by a direct revelation from Jesus. So the way I see it, natural explanations actually are, are more likely inherently and actually explain the evidence well. I don't have to come up with ad hoc hypotheses. Uh, now, Mike said that his theory satisfies a condition of plausibility. The problem is, as he defined it, plausibility requires that you to not break any, not violate any widely accepted facts. Now, the existence of God is not a widely accepted fact. 
nor is the existence of a particular god a widely accepted fact. For example, uh, there's Allah, there's uh, Hindu gods, there's different gods. And they're not all going to resurrect Jesus. So the question is, why should we assume that? Do we have to assume that God exists before we can conclude that Jesus rose from the dead? Now suppose you do an independent investigation, you check all the facts, you look into things, and you conclude that mm, you're not very convinced that God exists independently of all this. If you reach that position and then you look at the historical evidence, the historical evidence won't be sufficiently convincing to persuade you, nor should it persuade you that Jesus rose from the dead. Now maybe if you have, if you're convinced God exists and you're convinced you know that he would raise Jesus from the dead, uh, and perhaps you have a spiritual experience yourself you, of experiencing Jesus, that would be a different scenario, but that wouldn't be a historical argument. Now he tasks me with coming up with specific hypotheses that that's not really necessary. All I have to do is show that there are a number of possible explanations that we can't rule out that actually do meet what we call plausibility, that do satisfy widely accepted facts regarding the science of the situation, the cultural anthropology, the religion, the culture of the time. There are many possible explanations I could go into. I'm not going to, but we could talk about different kinds of ones. I don't actually claim to know which actual explanation occurred. We know very little. that We have very little reliable information about the origins of Christianity. But there aren't any facts on the table that I can't explain using accepted, acknowledged uh, kinds of explanations that we actually do know operate in the world. There are many theories contrary to what Mike has argued, but there isn't time tonight to look at them all. I will instead present the one theory I think is most probably correct, which I only have time to summarize. Shortly after the death of Jesus, his disciples prayed, meditated, and searched the scriptures for some meaning to justify the tragedy, and some way to preserve and promote the noble program of moral reform Jesus had died for. As a result, some had prophetic dreams or visions in which Jesus appeared to them, reassuring them, and telling them just what they wanted to hear that he had been raised by God so all who attached themselves to him and his moral program would participate in his resurrection as soon as this good news was preached to all Israel. The relevant content of this belief was that Jesus had been granted a new body by God, the resurrection body promised to all the faithful, abandoning his old body to the grave like a shell or husk to return to the dust from which it came. And this new, but the new body lived in heaven from where Jesus would soon return on clouds of glory to give us our own new bodies at the end of days. Such, I believe, was the original belief. But the church quickly fragmented into competing sects with different agendas. And over the first century, some groups became more and more Gnostic, while others became more and more sarcissistic. Gnosticism gravitated to the view that only the soul of Jesus was exalted, while sarcissism was the opposite view, that Jesus was raised only in the flesh, in the very same body that died and was buried. I believe both views are distortions of what the original Christians believed, yet both arose at roughly the same time and pace. Just as the Gnostics developed novel legends to explain and justify their view of things, so did the Sarcissists. The canonical gospels represent the parables and legends adopted or developed to serve the Sarcissist program, and that was uh, the one and only sect to obtain total power and preserve for posterity its documents and its own version of history. That is my theory in rough outline. Now I have to explain why my theory is a better explanation of the facts than Mike's. There are nine facts that together establish that my theory is more probably correct. Number one, Paul contradicts the Gospels of Luke and John by describing a spiritual resurrection. This is significant because Paul's letters predate the writing of the Gospels and are the only sources recorded within 20 years of the death of Jesus. In addition, unlike the authors of the Gospels, Paul's name and identity is known to us with relative certainty, and he alone names his sources and confirms them as eyewitnesses. Therefore, what Paul says carries far more historical authority than the relatively anonymous documents written down decades later that relied on unnamed and unverified sources. Since the most relevant passage from 1 Corinthians 15 is so important, I will read an abridgment of it as I have translated from the Greek. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? and with what kind of body do they come? You idiot, what you sow is not given life unless it dies, and what you sow you do not sow the body that will come to be, but a naked seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body, just as he pleased, and to each of the seeds he gives a body all its own. Not all flesh is the same flesh, but there is one sort of flesh for men, another flesh for cattle, another flesh for birds, and another for fish. There are also bodies in heaven and bodies on earth, 
But the glory of the heavenly ones is beyond the glory of the earthly ones. There is one glory for the sun, another glory for the moon, etc. So also is the resurrection of the dead. A natural body is sown, but a spiritual body is raised. So also is it written, the first man, Adam, turned into a living life form, but the last Adam into a life-giving spirit. But the spiritual body is not first. Rather, first comes the natural body, then the spiritual body. The first man is made of dust from the earth. The second man is made of something from heaven. As is the one of dust, so also are those of dust. And as is the one in heaven, so also are those in heaven. And just as we once wore the image of the one of dust, let us also come to wear the image of the one in heaven. I say this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot receive the kingdom of God, nor does decay receive indestructibility. Look, I tell you a mystery. Not all of us will fall asleep, but we'll all be changed in an instant, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet. That is what Paul wrote roughly 20 years after the death of Jesus. Note that Paul explicitly says the resurrected Jesus was a spirit, and that flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom. In fact, earlier, Paul had even said that our resurrected body will not have a stomach and so will not eat food. And here he adds that it will be completely indestructible. That's what Paul says, and that is clearly how he understood the resurrection to be. Yet this contradicts what Luke and John say. Luke claims that Christ said, A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And then he eats some fish to prove it. John claims the resurrected body of Jesus was still wounded, which cannot be if it was indestructible. So from Paul we learn that Jesus was a spirit and had no stomach and thus wouldn't eat, that his body could not be blemished and that it did not consist of flesh or blood, but of some spiritual heavenly substance. Yet Luke and John claim Jesus did eat, did have blemishes, did consist of flesh and blood, and was not a spirit. Our earliest and most reliable record says one thing, and our later record says exactly the opposite. One of them must be wrong. And most likely, it's the later, less secure sources that have it wrong. Number two, Paul omits these very crucial claims of Luke and John. It is more probable that those claims were contrived after Paul's time, than that they existed at the very origin of the church, and yet Paul had never heard of them. Since his discussion here in 1 Corinthians concerned answering questions about the nature of the resurrection body, it is hardly conceivable that Paul would fail to cite the most powerful and relevant evidence, physical eyewitness encounters revealing exactly what that body was like. Number three, Paul declares that Christ's resurrection was just like ours will be, but he describes our resurrection in terms that can only be understood as exchanging one body for another, not changing the same body into something else. Paul explicitly says, the body that dies is not the body that will rise, but God provides its own body. Paul takes great pains to explain that there are many different bodies, especially between bodies in heaven and on earth, and that our new bodies will be spiritual bodies, composed of the same stuff of the glorious stars. Paul goes out of his way to assert that the spiritual body comes after the natural body that dies. In all this, he specifically avoids ever simply saying that the natural body will become a spiritual body. He doesn't say that. His whole discourse emphasizes difference in substance and origin. Dust belongs to the earth. Spirit belongs to heaven. It follows that the body of dust must be left behind, that this is the only way to enter the heavenly realm of the indestructible. As Paul says, we will put on our new bodies like new coats, suggesting the old coat will be left behind. In fact, in Paul's phrase, we'll all be changed, he uses the Greek word alagesamatha, which does not mean change in the sense of changing one thing into another, but is instead the verb of mercantile exchange, of trading one thing for another. This two-body doctrine was the view held by the Essene Jews, the one sect that had the most in common with the early Christian church. And it was also held by a prominent first century Jew, Josephus, a Pharisee who specifically explains that our current bodies are inevitably corruptible and must return to the earth from which they came. So God will give us new, better bodies and in the resurrection. Philo, another Jew and a contemporary of Paul, also held to a similar view. And Josephus and Philo often use the very same concepts and language as Paul. Thus, there is a good probability that Paul shared their view and understood the resurrection just as they did as an exchange of an old shell of a body for a new heavenly body. This would explain one peculiar fact about the letters of Paul, why he never once mentions the empty tomb or any details of the empty tomb story. Because the tomb wasn't empty, rather the corpse was empty, for the spirit of Jesus had been transported into a new body in heaven, just as Josephus, Philo, and the Essenes all believed would happen, and just as Paul seems to have described. 
Now, later stories in the Gospels about an empty tomb and appearances are the only evidence Mike has against my theory. But my theory is based on earlier and more reliable evidence, has precedence in early Jewish thought, and already has the greater probability. It is the best and simplest explanation for what Paul both says and doesn't say. But there is more evidence that the empty tomb story is, more probably than not, a legend, which probably began as a literary symbol and not a claim to historical fact, and that the original appearances were more probably than not ordinary religious visions, later embellished to support the Sarcissist dogma. So now to those facts. Number four. Throughout history, we have found that the frequency of amazing but true stories is low, very low. Such stories are rare, while the frequency of myths, legends, and tall tales is very high. Such stories are common. It follows that the probability that any amazing story will be false is higher than the probability it will be true. That doesn't mean every amazing story is false, only that this is more likely. Nor does this mean that we can never prove an amazing story true, uh, it, only that we need especially strong evidence to overcome their low probability. In contrast, my theory rests on what is already the most probable, given what we know about history in general. Number five, there is insufficient evidence to overcome the low probability that the empty tomb story is true. Being an amazing story, it is already likely to be false. To prove it is not, we need some good evidence. But the evidence we have is not at all good. In fact, it is among the worst we can have for any historical claim. There are five kinds of evidence we can have in history, and the more and better evidence we have from this list, the more certain we can be that a claim is true. Uh, as an example, I will compare the claim that the tomb of Jesus was found empty with the claim that Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon. First, the physical historical necessity of this event is exceedingly great. The history of Rome could not have proceeded as it did had Caesar not physically moved an army into Italy. He could not have captured Rome or conscripted Italian men against Pompey's forces in Greece. In contrast, the discovery of an empty tomb is not necessary, for as we have seen, the original belief may well have been that Jesus switched bodies and appeared in visions. That would be sufficient to get the religion started. Thus, an empty tomb is not necessary to explain all subsequent history, unlike Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon. Second, in Caesar's case, we have lots of direct physical evidence. We have a number of inscriptions and coins produced soon after the Republican Civil War related to the Rubicon crossing. In contrast, we have no physical evidence of any kind supporting the empty tomb. No papyri survive and no inscriptions were commissioned by the resurrected Jesus or by the early church or by witnesses like Peter or Joseph of Arimathea. Third, for Caesar, we have unbiased corroboration. Even Caesar's enemies, like Cicero, reported the crossing of the Rubicon, as did other hostile or neutral observers. Whereas we have no hostile or even neutral records of an empty tomb by any non-Christian until well after the Christians started telling the story, after Paul's death, and long after any facts could be checked. Fourth, we have several crit credible, critical accounts of the Rubicon crossing by known scholars of the time, Suetonius, Appian, Cassius Dio, Plutarch. And we know a lot about who they were and their scholarship. They often quote and name many different sources, showing a wide reading of witnesses and documents, and they critically examine several disputed claims. They also cite or quote texts written by witnesses and contemporaries, hostile and friendly, of the Rubicon crossing and its repercussions. In contrast, we have not even a single skilled historian mentioning the empty tomb until centuries after the fact. While of those who mention the empty tomb within the first century, None show any wide reading, never name any sources, show no sign of a skilled or critical examination of conflicting claims, have no detailed scholarship to their credit that we can test for their skill and accuracy, are essentially unknown, and have an overtly declared bias towards persuasion and conversion. Fifth, there is an eyewitness account, for we have Caesar's own word on the subject. Indeed, the book The Civil War has been a Latin classic for 2,000 years. In contrast, we have nothing written by Jesus nor any record of the empty tomb by eyewitnesses like Peter. And we do not know for certain the name or identity of any author of any of the accounts of the empty tomb that we do have, much less the name of any of their immediate sources. It should be clear that we have many reasons to believe Caesar crossed the Rubicon, all of which are lacking in the case of the empty tomb. In fact, when we compare all five points, we see that in four of them, the empty tomb has no evidence at all, and in the one proof that it does have, it has not the best, but the very worst kind of evidence, a handful of late, biased, uncritical, unscholarly, unknown, second-hand witnesses. That's not good evidence. Even seen in the best possible light, 
the evidence available is simply not sufficient to establish that there really was an empty tomb. Number six, the Gospels themselves show signs of an increasing rate of legendary development. ...rise of newfangled Gospels containing false claims, including myths and clever fabrications. We should certainly expect this only grew worse after Paul's day, when our Gospels were finally written. The first Gospel, Mark, tells a simple story about women going to the tomb and finding it open, meeting a single boy in white, then running off. The whole account is probably a parable and never intended to be read as history. But in the Gospel of Matthew, which simply borrowed from Mark and added to it, the boy has become an angel descending from heaven. The women experience a massive earthquake and watch the angel descend and see it open the tomb. Guards have been added to the story, and the women run off but now get to meet Jesus on the way. Can we doubt that we are looking at extensive legendary embellishment upon what began as a much more mundane story? We can see the same trend in Luke. Mark's one boy in white has been multiplied into two men who suddenly appear in dazzling apparel. Now we hear that Peter went to check the tomb and confirmed it was empty. And Jesus appears in the flesh and invites his disciples to touch him and eats fish to prove he's real, then whooshes up into heaven before their very eyes. That again sounds like a pretty fancy embellishment of Mark's far more humble story. In John, Jesus receives an absurdly fabulous burial. Peter again goes to see for himself, but this time yet another disciple goes too. Luke's two men now become two angels, and we get the elaborate tale of the doubting Thomas putting his fingers inside the wounds on Christ's body, and Jesus declaring, Blessed are they who believe without seeing. All this certainly looks like a growing legend. Number seven we have found that genuine supernatural encounters must be extraordinarily rare, since despite 200 years of detailed scientific investigation, we have yet to confirm a single genuine case. In contrast, across the whole spectrum of human history and culture, inspiring religious dreams and hallucinations are quite common. Indeed, they are most frequent in cultures that elevate the status of such experiences, like the ancient world. And we have numerous examples of powerful dreams and hallucinations of pagan deities. We have also established the psychological and neurophysical basis of religious hallucination. It follows that the probability any appearance of God will really be a dream or hallucination is much higher than the probability of a genuine encounter with God. That doesn't mean every such encounter is false, only that this is more likely. Nor does this mean that we can never prove such an encounter genuine, only that we need especially strong evidence to overcome its low probability. In contrast, my theory rests on what is already the most probable, given what we know about human nature, the human brain, and the history of religions and ancient culture. Number eight. Paul describes the appearances of Jesus in terms more consistent with a vision than a physical body. He places himself on the list of witnesses to the risen Christ, along with Peter, James, and everyone else. And in Paul's letter to the Galatians, he says, I neither received the gospel from a man, nor was I taught it, except through a revelation of Jesus Christ. A revelation, he specifically says, was not an encounter with flesh and blood. And the book of Acts describes Paul's experience as a vision, just a light and a voice, commonplace features of hallucination. That our earliest and best evidence would be of this character, while the only evidence of a more physical encounter with Jesus comes much later from much less secure sources, is more probable if the original experiences were in fact like Paul's vision, and less probable if they were like what some Gospels strive to depict. Number nine, Mark and Matthew don't mention Jesus appearing in the flesh, and Luke and John share the detail that Jesus suddenly appeared and disappeared on some occasions, as one would expect of a vision, and on other occasions appeared as someone else whose face no one recognized, which was a common motif in ancient religion, the god or angel appearing in disguise to test us. In contrast, details supporting a resurrection of the flesh arise only in Luke, and then appear in John, who is not an independent source, since he borrowed many unique scenes from Luke. That our only evidence for a resurrection of the flesh would be entirely traceable to only one source, which we know came later than, and embellished upon, a source excluding those details, is more probable if it's a late fabrication, and less probable if it was part of the original tradition. So those are the nine facts that support my theory more than Mike's. There's a lot more, but I've outlined the main reasons for believing as I do. That we would have those facts rather than others is more probable if my theory is true and less probable if Mike's theory is true. So the theory that visions inspired a belief that Jesus had been transported into the new heavenly body of the promised resurrection 
fits all nine facts better than any other theory. Now, obviously, we can construct some elaborate hypothesis to explain away all this evidence. But my explanation will still remain the simplest and thus the most probable, the one most loyal to what Paul himself says, and the one most consistent with known probabilities and all the actual facts of history. Thank you.